Hello, 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 everybody. Hello. Hello. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> good evening from yes. Anglesey, <laughs> North Wales. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh we have to introduce here. ourselves. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Gentlemen first. Oh, am I going first? Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Christopher Hughes. I'm here in a very damp and very windy North Wales on the island of Anglesey. I'm the head of the Anglesey Druid Order, a polytheistic, magical, druidic community here on the blessed island of the Druids. That was in ancient times, the headquarters of Druidry in the Celtic world. I'm an author and I've written um, a bunch of books for Llewellyn. And um, yeah, and that's about it. I'm a first language Welsh speaker and I live here on the island with my husband and our cat Lily. Lovely. <laughs> Who's next? <laughs> Mark. Ooh, I'll, I'll go next. next. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it's okay, I you go, Stephanie. Stephanie. And I am a priestess of the Morgan, an Irish polytheist. Um, my spirituality is very much about connecting to the gods of Ireland and uh, connecting with deity in general. I run a lot of different events, including the Morgan's Call Retreat in Connecticut, which is an event that's all about the Morgan. And I run some local events as well here in Orlando, um, including Pagans in the Park. I write a bunch of books for Llewellyn. And my most recent one is Dedican Devotee and Priest, which is all about devotional practice. And um, I also have some cats who are my little minions, <laughs> Lucy uh, and Kira, who may or may not show up on the screen today. So that's me. Who wants to go next? Oh, I'll jump in. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. My name is Mara. Um, I'm from Anglesey originally, like Christopher, currently living in very wet and windy Chester as well in Cheshire. Um, I'm a virgin, so I've never done this before. It's my first time, so go easy on me. And I'm the author of Welsh Witchcraft, A Guide to the Spirits, Lore and Magic of Wales, which just came out recently. Uh, so I'm a Welsh folk witch. My tradition is informed and inspired by the um, folklore and myth, as well as the history of folk magic in Wales. So I'm very focused on folk magic and very practical approaches to magic which is informed by the magic of the land that I was raised in. Lovely. And I'm Jenna. I'm coming to you from Ithaca, New York. Um, I'm the founder of the Sisterhood of Avalon. I'm a lifelong devotee of uh, Welsh <clears throat> divinities, a uh, Brythonic polytheist. Um, what else? I've written a couple of books for Llewellyn, mostly about my work in the Avalonian tradition. These are my two, and there's a, another that's pending. And um, I live here in central New York with my two children, my two cats, and my way too many books. Um, and it's just lovely to be here with you today. Yay. Now, I've just noticed that Llewellyn down there have asked for a bit of introductory material of how exactly we would define Celtic paganism and witchcraft and how it differs from other traditions. I mean, I can speak about the, the paganism aspect possibly because, um, you know, I'm very much engrossed in my culture here as a Welsh person and there's so much magic within our heritage and our ancestry and our culture that it was just too much of a temptation not to be able to somehow connect to that from a spiritual perspective. So around, oh, I don't know, decades and decades and decades ago, because I'm significantly older than I look because I work with embalming solutions. But um, I, um, I, it was just too much of a good thing. I thought, no, I've got to somehow connect to all of this wondrous stuff that's here. So to me, uh, my druidry is Welsh in flavour because I'm Welsh and Welsh is my, my first language. And I connect to the spirit of the ancient druidry through my current modern day druid practice and um and it's rather fabulous you know because we can actually visit all of the, mm. the deities mythological landscape here i live in a mythological landscape which is really really incredible and um and i came to it just because it was seemingly in my nature 
to do so. And while some people say, oh, do druids practice magic? Yes, we do practice magic. We practice folk magic. So we have witches who are members of our order. We have druids and heathens and all sorts of people who come to druidry because they're seeking a connection perhaps to the land and to different cultures. And um, and I've seen that everybody else plugged a book and I forgot to plug a book. This is my latest. Keridwen, Celtic <laughs> goddess of inspiration. So that's my story. Who's next? I'll just jump in because it just jumps on what Christopher had to say. I don't practice witchcraft per se, um, but I, I love a lot of people who do. Uh, I'm more of a devotional polytheist. And I think it's important for those of us who don't live in the landscapes where um, the myths live, uh, that if you can, to, to visit them and to bring some of that magic home, it's, it's an experience that... Um, that changes everything in my experience. But those of us who cannot, one of the bridges into these practices, I think, is through myth, is through the the, the literature, is through um, coming into relationship with the gods. And for me, the best way to do that has been uh, through engaging with myth. And um, and I think as well as someone who is not Welsh, um, that is important when you are engaging in a cultural practice that is outside of your own, that there needs to be a respect for that practice, that there needs to be some engagement in that culture by doing things like learning the language, by studying the history and the lore, by engaging in some traditional practice of music or art or that sort of thing. Again, one of those things that bridges connection and it's a way, of, it's a devotional act, it's a way of honoring. So there's sort of a sympathetic magic in that as well, because you get to understand a little bit more about the gods that you're honoring when you are engaging in a practice related to the culture from which the gods have arisen. So um, that's kind of a powerful piece of magic and uh, connection for me. Wonderful. I think I'll, I'll just jump in if that's okay, because I'm Ooh. kind of following the same stream as Christopher and Jenna there. Where, um, so I'm a Celtic polytheist. I do identify as a Celtic polytheist. And with that, that's very focused on the land that I was raised in. So like Christopher, I grew up in a rural Welsh kind of area, uh, first language Welsh speaker. So it was kind of like I was drawn to paganism first, just as a uh, general subject. And then I met um, some strange druid person that might be here in the chat with us right now. And um, I was kind of introduced to a more uh, local focused uh, stream of paganism, which was inspired by the myths and legends that I was raised with. I remember um, getting really engrossed in like learning about the gods and goddesses of Wales, and uh, I devoted myself to them from a very young age. But then my focus has always been um, folk witchcraft and folk magic in general as well. So I practice um, witchcraft on top of my Celtic polytheism, and I always kind of see those two things as they work together, but they are separate as well. It's like they do co uh, collide with each other a lot, and there's a lot of overlap. But in general, witchcraft tends to be, in my eyes, more of a practical thing rather than a spiritual thing. It's more just get this done, let's get this done. And it's more of an everyday thing that I do. Whereas my polytheism is more devotional and more focused on connecting to the land and to the spirits of this land. So I do see them as different, but there is a lot of overlap. So like I will bring the gods into the folk magic that I do. But then as well, because I'm a folk witch, I don't define myself as purely just pagan in nature either, because a lot of folk magic comes from uh, various periods in time in Wales where it includes Christianity and things. So I always kind of define my path as a crooked path, which is a term you hear a lot these days in modern witchcraft. But for me, it means that I kind of move side to side from one form of practice to another quite frequently and I'm not kind of stuck down one road it's kind of flip-flopping between the two so my practice is very much informed by Celtic polytheism and also then the historical and folkloric folk magic of Wales and um, yeah. Oh, well I'll jump in um, I very much agree my witchcraft practice is very separate from my spiritual practice and they definitely go hand in hand but they're not quite the same thing. And as far as defining Celtic paganism or witchcraft, it's kind of hard because it's really just an umbrella term. And I think a lot of people don't always realize that there's so many different traditions that can be under that umbrella term. It might be something Irish. It might be a Welsh tradition. It could be someone who's a Gaulish reconstructionist. It could mm -hmm. be so many different things. 
That's right. There isn't one monolithic Celtic culture with one, um, you know, pantheon in, that is shared. I mean, the Celts lived in a very wide uh, time period and a very wide breadth of land. Uh, so you have to be very a little more specific, I think, uh, about what you're talking about when you're talking about Celtic. But a good way to start, if you're new, is to kind of start reading some, I think, start reading some of the myths and perhaps see what culture draws, draws you in first. Yeah, very much so. And I, and I also think as well that it's important when, when we consider Celtic paganism or Celtic witchcraft or whatever guise that might take in your mind, that we also consider as well that, um, that the Celts are also of now. You know, we're, we're, we're still here. We're still alive. We're still functioning. We still have culture and society. And that it's progressive and it develops and it evolves as well with the people. So being um, a Celt and a Welsh person here in Wales, I'm, I'm obviously fascinated by my ancestors and what they can lend and inspire to the present. But I'm also very much taken by what is, is apparent now and what is appropriate today. Because, you know, there's probably an awful lot of my Celtic ancestors, they wouldn't necessarily agree with the way I live my life. And I probably wouldn't have agreed with the way they lived their lives. So there's a crossover point somewhere. And I think that can be found in modernity. But I think sometimes people also forget that when when we speak of the Celts, it's, it's very tempting to speak of them as past tense, as something that has been, rather than also something that exists today. But I love that. I love the, the beauty of that and also the, the freedom that that gives you to be able to explore other things. There's so, you know, just here in, in the islands of Britain alone, we've got the, 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 the Manx influence, the Irish influence, the Scottish, the Cornish, the, the English. There's, there's so much in this tiny little island that you can fit in one of America's Great Lakes. You know, and, um, and then there's even more in on the on the continent, and um, and we've all borrowed from each other over the centuries, over the millennia, and we're still doing so. And I find that that's so uh, it enthralls me that it's such a vibrant thing. This cauldron of Celticism, this Celtic cultural continuum, continues to thrive, and Celtic paganism. Um, is, is a really important part of that, especially you know, I've noticed a couple of people here saying that they're learning to speak Irish or they're learning to speak Welsh. Mm -hmm. And I need to tell you that those of you who do, those of you who are learning Welsh, you are our heroes. And I don't mean that flippantly or, you know, um, lightly. I mean it literally by, by learning our language, you are helping to save our culture. So thank you, because we're, we're very much something of the present. <gasps> oh, Llewellyn has asked, what do you feel are the most important aspects of your Celtic spiritual practice? Who's going to answer that mm -hmm. one? I'll go. Um, I think the most important part of my practice is making it a daily practice. Mm -hmm. It's not just something that happens in ritual. I love ritual. Um, but, you know, I can't do a big fancy ritual every day. So it has to be something that I can do daily, something that has meaning to me daily where I can connect to the gods that I worship. Absolutely. I think um, if it's okay for me to jump in quickly, um, my a lot of my kind of paganism and witchcraft, both of them combined, uh, are very focused on finding who I am. And I think I talked about that a little in my book where I said like my Welshness and my paganism or polytheism is very much mixed quite well. And it helped me to identify exactly how I could be proud of my culture as well, because I've spoken in the past about like how when I was growing up, there was a little bit of um, almost, I wouldn't say shame, but there was a little bit of hesitance to accept the fact that I was Welsh because growing up in such a rural place and being openly queer, it was kind of this strange thing where I didn't feel like I fully belonged. And there was this feeling because I grew up in what we call like a Joskin area, which is like a rural kind of farming area. Um, it, unless you were into farming or football, um, you, you didn't really fit in. So it was kind of like, I couldn't wait to leave when I was a, younger, when I was like in my preteens, I couldn't wait to leave Wales. And when I found paganism, it gave me the sense of belonging that nothing else had before. And then meeting people like Chris who had devoted themselves to the land and to the gods of the land. So my relationship, it's kind of this two-way system where 
I build a relationship with the land and with the gods. And in turn, they help me see so much of myself in a in a better light than I ever did. And it's deeply transformative. So for me, the most important aspects are about connecting to the culture, connecting to the land, connecting to the people and building community as well. And in doing so, I build up my own kind of sense of self-worth. So it's great. <laughs> mm. And just to add my piece, I think for me, it's being in service. There are many ways of being in service, primarily service to the gods. And some ways of being in service to the gods are things like devotional practices daily, um, continuing study, those sorts of things. But there's also service to myself where I try to work within myself to become the best version of myself that I can be so I can be in clearer service to others and to be in service to the community. And that can mean, you know, through teaching, through the community of the sisterhood and connection with other people, but it's also uh, in service to my family, service to my community around me. Uh, Christopher always talks about taking care of your square mile. What can I do to be in service to raise up what is around? I think those are ways of being um, um, in service to the divine, uh, being our best selves and uh, working to have the world around us to be its best self. Mm. I've just noticed that Janine has asked a question there of how were you introduced or drawn to your spiritual choice, pagan, druid, witchcraft, etc. Was it your family practicing or or friends? And I wouldn't mind answering that really quickly because I, I was introduced to all of it at a really young age in school, in primary school, we'd call it here in the United Kingdom. I'm not sure what they would call that in the rest of the world from about ages four to, to 10, 11. And, um, and we had a, a, a school teacher who used to read us uh, tales from the Mabinogi, a collection of Welsh mythologies. And it always felt to me as if I was hearing news from home. It always felt profoundly familiar. I could taste everything about it in my in my entire being. And when I would play on the mountains in, in, in the landscape of, of Welsh mythology, I would play with, with those characters. They were always uh, an integral aspect, an element of my landscape. So they never felt as if I had to be introduced to them as such. I always felt as if they were always there. So when the option was suddenly realized within me that I could express this within a spirituality. It just felt completely natural. So I was very lucky in that respect that I just grew up here. And, and now when I look out of my window, I can see, you know, Aranrod's castle. I can see uh, the, the town where Branwen and Bran were engaged in all sorts of adventures. And, and it's just all here. So, so I, I'm, I'm very lucky. I count myself to be very lucky that I didn't have to be introduced to it. It was just a natural part of my landscape. But what about everybody else? How did you all get into it? Well, I was always into mythology myself from a very young age, but it was mostly classical mythology. And I remember thinking, I wish I was born in ancient times so I could worship Athena and all of these things. And so I was always very into that. And then I got into Arthurian tradition and uh, read all of those books. And it was through that that I found the gods of Wales, you know. Um, I had to learn about it. I was like, wait, wait a minute. These are these. Are, oh, so it, it expands on a whole world for me. And, um, you know, uh, that, that's kind of how I got my start. And so it was mostly those practices. And again, it's the it's the myth and, and uh, that, that drew me that drew me in because I am not Welsh uh, by heritage or by circumstance. So um, sometimes you go where the Awen flows, I suppose. And that's where it was for me. I'll jump in. Um, well, basically, the Morgan just showed up in my life. So that's kind of... <laughs> so that's it, happened. period. <laughs> um, I, I am Irish and Greek. I actually was more obsessed with Greek mythology growing up. So I mean, it's maybe a little surprising that I ended up on the Irish side. But um, my grandmother is from Ireland as well. So I was familiar with the mythology. But uh, yeah, the Morgan just really showed up right when I said I was not going to take a patron deity. The group I was working with had a very big focus on at some point you have to pick a patron. And I had this whole speech lined up where I was like, no, I'm going to work with all the gods. I don't have to pick just one. And then the next day I had this really intense dream where the Morgan showed up. And um, then she continued to show up with crows and birds, one of which that walked into my office that I worked at mm -hmm. and was flying around the office and had to be shooed out by my very frazzled boss. So um, <laughs> yeah, when the Morgan shows up, you can't, you don't really have much of a choice. 
Mm-hmm. And the rest is history. <laughs> Gosh, I think for me as well. I similar to Chris, I I grew up in in a Welsh area, so I was kind of introduced to like the Mabinocchi and things from a very young age, and taught these stories and uh, little bits of folklore and such. And it was part of our everyday life. Like we would, I remember when I was young, we went for a walk to um one this like area in uh, my village that I grew up in, which we call a peak, which is like this cliff that overlooks the Irish Sea, and on it there's this um, ancient monument called Troy or what remains of it and I remember my teachers taking us there and being like this is where Branwen got married to the Irish king Matholoch and it was like the tales were living and were part of our everyday life and then as I got older I got interested in folklore and magic and um, I found a little book in a charity shop which was a spell book just just this random little kind of kiddie spell book and I started doing the spells in it and it wasn't until I kind of, I I met Chris and I met other Welsh pagans that I was reintroduced to the stories that we were raised within. And it kind of clicked in my head. I was like, wait, this could actually be part of my practice, my spiritual practice and my uh, magical practice. This can actually be the core part of it. I don't need to look uh, miles and miles away. I can look right here on my doorstep. And that was quite invigorating when I kind of realized that. And I'm quite ashamed to say that it took me so long to realize it. But yeah, it's always been about kind of uh, connecting to where I'm from since then. And so it was very transformative to be reintroduced to these kind of myths and legends and stories that were so deeply important to our ancestors, but are still deeply important to the lived culture today. <laughs> well, we oh, look at that. There's an interesting question there from uh, from Phoenix, who asks, have any of your practices changed because of the pandemic? That's interesting, isn't it? Is there anything that you have found that helps you connect during this time? Mm-hmm. Well, in-person things have kind of trickled out. We are very community-oriented, uh, both locally and in travel. Um, I know myself, we like to take uh, pilgrimages to uh, sites in in the British Isles to connect in those areas. And we haven't been able to do that for a few years. So it does kind of uh, reorient to other ways of being in connection uh, through through various ways of study, through devotional practices. And um, I I guess that it is uh, much more individual, although media mediums like this allow us to still connect to the wider community. So I'm grateful for that piece of magic, the Zoom magic that we all have been partaking in. Yeah, and it is magic as well, isn't it? It is kind of, mm-hmm. it's, it's a really liminal space between the worlds, literally exactly. between the worlds. And and I and in the beginning, I cringed a little when somebody said, you're going to broadcast your rituals live on the internet. And I thought, oh gosh, is that going to work? And it did. And suddenly, Thousands of people are able to engage in something. And, and I've, I've loved the fact that if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's taught us that we can be more inclusive. We can be more inclusive mm-hmm. of people who have physical or mental disabilities who aren't able to get to conferences and workshops and, you know, and do all the things that so many of us take for granted. And I love that the pandemic has taught us we can reach out. We can, we can inspire one another through this, through this medium, which is, you know, let's face it, to our ancestors, this would have been the epitome of witchcraft. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to one another in magic mirrors. All the world. That's right. <laughs> yes. It's fabulous. And I do so, hope yeah, that we you... continue. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm. Oh, no, saying, I right. hope yeah, we continue sure. with this, uh, mm. you know, because the accessibility, as you said, is huge. It, it doesn't uh, limit um, who, who can participate in the wide world of paganism by who has the ability to travel and who has the ability to, um, you know, participate on those levels. Yeah, I think so many, so much of the stuff that we are doing are suddenly going hybrid. They're, they're becoming mm-hmm. in-person and simultaneously being broadcast via the, the internet. It's brilliant. I love it. What's next? She had asked a question about, um, oh, our gods. You've all mentioned, this is from Llewellyn, you've all mentioned working with the gods and goddesses. What can you speak, can you speak more to that? What are your favorite ways to connect with them? Well, I'll go. Um, This is a practice that a friend of mine started, um, Gina. And her whole idea is that you should have coffee with your gods in the morning. And it's something that I really love doing. 
So it's um, something you can do every day. I need my coffee in the morning and just taking those few minutes and just talking to deity and taking that time to also be quiet while you're drinking your coffee and listen. Because I think sometimes we say a lot to our gods, but we don't always take that moment of silence to actually listen and hear what they are saying back to us. So, you know, something easy you can do. Coffee uh, with the Morgan or with whatever god you want in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice, isn't it, to incorporate them into into our ordinary daily secular rituals, and that they just become a part and parcel of of our of our fixtures of our furniture. And I work a lot with Keridwen, obviously, because I'm a writer, so I like to connect with her because of Awen and inspiration. So she's mm -hmm. she's always there on my altar on both sides of the room, and um and they, yeah, so somebody like Keridwen to me, she's constantly always there. There isn't a particular set time of day that I devote prayers or offerings or or sing songs to her. She's just always a constant companion. And whereas other other gods and goddesses, I'll I'll go to their locations that are specific to their mythologies and honor them every now and again. And um, but yeah, but generally that that family tree of gods that are just um, an integral part of my life, really. Similar, I suppose. I have um, I have devotional shrines around my home, uh, but I also have a seasonal practice. So I, I touch in with all of the gods that I honor at particular times in the year uh, or when need arises. But uh, when I'm working on particular things, um, you know, those are the shrines that. Um, that that's set up and, and that I'll work with on a daily practice. So again, I think, you know, coming into relationship, listening, offerings, uh, study, um, being open. I like to read the myths and um, integrate them into myself. What is a mirror reflection? What's going on in the story? What am I resonating with? These are these are good ways to, I guess, to start to build those relationships with the gods for the first time um, and, and to continue to do that. What, what, what can I learn from this myth that is um, relevant to my situation here and now? I think I um when I talk about my connection to the gods I think sometimes it can come across as if uh, I'm talking about it in a very transactional way uh which is like I always say oh you know I called to Kelly Dwen to help me write this book uh, or something but in reality I think it's the other way around maybe sometimes Kelly Dwen called to me and said you need to do this because uh unless you do you're going to be waiting a long long time for someone else to do it so get off your backside and get to it. And in a way, a lot of the things that I've done in my life, um, I look back at them and I think that was an offering. That was an offering to the land and to the spirits that I work with. And I didn't even realize it because I just woke up one morning and it was like in my head what I needed to do. And it's almost like looking in retrospect, I can see where they kind of interacted and filled me with this immense sense of inspiration and joy that I needed to get started. I mean, even now I'm working on a few projects right now and um, a few weeks back, I was working on one specific project and I was so dedicated, like, I need to do this and get this done. But then I woke up one morning and it was like, oh, no, I need to do this other project, this completely new one, which made me feel like I was flip flopping and not having any discipline at all to what I was doing and made me feel really bad. But then every time I came away from that new project, it always there was a sense of guilt inside me. And I clicked and realized something is pulling me and telling me you need to be doing this right now. And I think for me as well, it's about um, really connecting with where you are. Uh, going back to that pandemic question earlier, I remember when um, when the pandemic first hit, it really hit me quite hard because I now live across the border, like just about barely across the border, but it's still across the border from Wales into England. And I wasn't allowed to travel. And that was my whole life going back and forth, you know, back to family on Anglesey and living here in England. And it was really jarring like not being allowed to go over there and at first the first few months it's almost like I came away from my uh, devotional practice and came away from my magical practice because I felt like I can't because I'm not connected to that landscape that my practice is more or less dependent on in many ways but then there was this moment where I had to like give myself a little bit of a slap across the face and go no you need to connect with what's right in front of you as well and it was really nice to learn more about the regional law and such and so like even though I live in England it's in an area that's on 
the border. So it's this very liminal space where we have Roman deities, Celtic deities intertwined. We have a shrine to Minerva on the river, the Roman mm -hmm. deity. And then we also have stories of other deities such as Eronwen because the river D connects to like Bala Lake and everything. So we even have that connection of Keridwen coming in. And it was kind of like a, a very revelationary moment to go, you don't have to go on the train all the way to Anglesey to reconnect. You can do it right here. And that moment was, I don't know, very kind of transformative. <laughs> yeah. I've seen, um, can I answer the question by Jake Morris? Does everybody mind? Um, Jake asks, how do you call upon your divinity and maintain devotion when everything in life, relationships, work, etc., completely falling apart? Oh my gosh, I so empathize with that question because the last two years have been horrifically traumatic. And you know, I, I work in, well, I did work in death services professions, uh, profession. I've, I've just left recently. And um, and when things are really traumatic, it is quite difficult. And I think sometimes we feel as if we, we have to maintain this constant connection at a particular level. But actually, I consider that the relationship that I have with my God isn't that dissimilar to my family. You know, when when... When I'm when I'm usually emotionally distressed or, or I just want to go and eat every bar of chocolate that I can find in the kitchen cupboard, I'll go and cry with my mum. You know, when I'm a 50-year-old man, but I still go and cry with my mum. And I still do that with my gods. And one of the ways that I that I do it is I just have a journal and I write letters to them. I don't know whether that sounds really pathetic, but I, I that's how I connect to them. If I feel really angry and bitter and resentful with things in my life, I write a letter to Manawidan, who to me invokes the, the, the ability to find peace, to find peace within yourself and peace within the world. So I'll write a letter to him and say, Manawidan, what am I supposed to do? And um, and then I might, you know, look in, in my, I love my tarot cards, so I might look at my tarot cards, but I have this, this kind of relationship with them that's very organic. And, you know, I'll go to certain members of my family for different requirements, or they might need me for different reasons. And I have a similar relationship with my gods. And I don't know if that helps, Jake, but, but that's how I maintain um, my devotion and connection to them is I write letters to them. <laughs> and, and I think they answer. <laughs> And not to say too much, but I, I will say that um, I think that in times of stress and times of struggle and times of challenge, that's the best time to go to before your gods. Some people feel like I need to be perfectly pure. I need to be perfectly clear. I need to be, no, bring your pain, bring your tears, bring your anger, bring your sorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so many of these stories, I think about Welsh tradition, because they were written down so much later, they're about interpersonal struggles. They're about very human things that we can relate to. They're not big cosmic. I mean, there are layers of of, of metaphor and all of that, but they're talking about things like child loss and domestic abuse and war and uh, struggle. And so it, it's much easier to get a sense that they understand where we're coming from. And that um, if you, you know, however you're connecting, if you listen, you receive what you need back. You receive that comfort, you receive those answers or that guidance. Yeah. What else are we looking at? Oh, what podcasts do you recommend we listen to and why? Mara, do you listen to podcasts? <laughs> I was going to say. Oh, I do. <laughs> um, I've been really interested in uh, Corey Hutchinson's podcast lately. Um, he's the author of, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what the book is called now but it's a very kind of focused on folk magic way, but it's not really, I think for anyone in kind of America, it's a very good way. I think it's called New World Witchery, which is the same title as the book. So for anyone interested in kind of folk magic, but specifically looking at folk magic that is regional and specific to you, especially if you're in the diaspora and you're over there, um, New World Witchery is a really good one. I've also been listening nonstop for the Welsh speakers out there. There's a podcast called Oven, which is literally uh, about the uh, supernatural in Wales. And I think the creator of that is working on an English translation of it. So uh, keep up to date with that. Um, I don't know. I think I don't I don't really follow any specific Celtic ones at the minute. I'm currently working on my own, but um, it's a long way off. I don't know if anyone has any suggestions for specifically Celtic ones that they listen to. Well, I know I someone here has a YouTube asked. channel where they talk about a lot of uh, Mara. You have a YouTube channel. Oh, it's me. Hi. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yes, I Just have a saying. YouTube channel. <laughs> I tend to listen to Druidcast. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that one because you can get lost. There's an awful lot of them out there. And um, so, yeah, and my other, the other one that I listen to religiously has got absolutely nothing to do with spirituality at all. It's all killer, no filler. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> and um, But it's absolutely nothing to do with <laughs> paganism and um so yeah um oh llewellyn says that we have to start wrapping things up oh. really that was quick it was <laughs> indeed llewellyn says on a final note what is the one thing yep only one that you want folks to know about celtic paganism and witchcraft Um, I'll jump in that it's, um, you do not have to have a background genetically in any of these places. Like if you're not Irish, you are still welcome (laughs) with the Irish polytheists. I think a lot of people um, feel that they might not be, but um, yeah, no, it is very welcoming. Doesn't matter that you are, have the DNA of those places, the gods call to whoever they call to. And to that, I would add um, that, as Christopher said, these are living traditions, living cultures, Mm -hmm. living peoples. And so if you are not of that culture, uh, to be respectful of that, to do your best to give back, to appreciate, not appropriate, uh, to listen to Native voices and do what you can to engage in culture, because that's a really powerful way both uh, to connect with our gods as a uh, as a devotional act and also to um, give something back to the culture from which your spirituality is uh, being influenced or inspired. Yeah, I think I, I, I'll kind of jump off of what Jenna was just saying and say uh, to remember that they are each in distinct cultures in their own regards as well, because we tend to kind of homogenize and talk about Celtic practices as if it's this one kind of thing. And people talk about it, like you were saying earlier, Jenna, like they talk about the Celtic pantheon when there isn't really such a thing as a Celtic pantheon. It's differing pantheons from various cultures and remembering that there are diff, even though we are all connected because we're all Celts and we're all cousins, um, to remember that we are also distinct cultures and to, like you said, acknowledge and respect that it's not some ancient fairy tale world in the past. It is happening now as well. It's a modern culture and we are all distinct cultures as well. Yeah, and I would say you know, nothing, nothing in, in, in my particular spiritual practice is a closed practice. And that if people are worried about things like cultural appropriation, that the only thing that's different between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation is education. And, and like everybody else has said, you know, educate yourselves into the, the different cultures, who, who those people are, how they live today, how they lived in the past. And, um, and I'm, I'm more than anything, enjoy it. It's a, it's a joyous yeah. thing to be a part of that brings light and joy and delight and wisdom and wonder and magic to all of our lives, uh, which is why we do it. <laughs> Beautifully said. Absolutely. Mm. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. Um, and blessings to everyone. Yes, it's been fabulous. And remember to follow us all on social media. We, we all have our pages mm-hmm. and things. So go and find <laughs> us, go and find our books and yeah, stay in touch. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I think this is going to be uh, posted somewhere and I think there are going to be links. So if you didn't catch uh, those of us who have weirdly spelled names, um, all of that will be available in those places as well. So you can reach out. <laughs> Oh it's been absolutely lovely talking to you all. The old Galon and Thank you 